Last talk of the month for our theme, Back to Basics. We started off with start where you are, then we talked about doing what we can, and today's talk is with what we have. Start where we are, do what we can with what we have. It's great advice. <clears throat> and sometimes we get caught up thinking that everything has to be perfect before we start. <laughs> so that's really what I'm talking about today with, with what we have, you know. Um, one of the things that is a stumbling block for us is that idea that everything has to be perfect before we start. You know, um, we're not content with starting just with what we have, just with what we have. Sometimes we think things have to be better or they have to be different or they have to be some other way or we have to be some other way before we start whatever it is that is on our heart to do. We have to get better or different somehow. And, um, and how many times has that stopped us from starting? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. That the conditions have to be perfect. Instead of just moving forward with the way things are and taking that next step, we have to have, or we think, we have to have all the pieces in place before we can begin whatever is on our heart. That new thing, that next project, our greatest goal. And guess what? If we have to have everything perfect before we begin, we don't ever start. We don't ever start. You know, before I write, oh, my desk has to be cleared. And then the desk is cleared, now it has to be dusted. <laughs> now after I dust it, it has to be polished. And then I can only write in the mornings. Only in the mornings can I write. Only on those mornings when it's raining. Okay, so there's always an endless series of conditions why I can't start. So we postpone and we postpone and we postpone until the conditions are perfect. The conditions are never going to be perfect. I'll write when I'm retired, <laughs> when the kids are grown, when they're in college, when they're out of the house, after I get enough sleep, when I get that degree, right? When I attend that writer's conference, when I get an editor, when I, when I, when I, when I. And when we wait and wait and wait for the conditions to be perfect, they're never perfect. You see where I'm going with this? So the conditions will never be perfect. And here's a little clue. The conditions will never be perfect because we're using the imperfections as a delaying tactic. Can't ever fail if we don't ever try. Right? a subtle little sabotaging of our lives. We can't ever fail if we don't try. So it's one of the ways that we subtly set ourselves back. We can just sabotage ourselves. If we're not, if we're not getting in touch with those little underlying fears and self-doubts and, and criticisms, if we're not getting in touch with those and healing those, we'll always have another reason not to start. We have to uncover those false beliefs, and they're about our worth. They're about the I, I amness of our soul. They're about doubting who we truly are in the world. <clears throat> no matter what the reason is that we're telling ourselves we can't start because whatever, it's a delaying tactic that we use. You know, and sometimes we get caught up saying, I'm not enough. First, the conditions are not right. And then it's, I'm not right, <laughs> so, so that I can't have or do or be or get what I want. So, so the conditions not being right are part of a larger stumbling block, which is, I'm not right. I'm not right. I never got that degree. I never finished college. Or I blew up my life with drugs and alcohol. Or, you know, I made some horrendous mistake and, and you know, and, and walked out of a career or got booted out of a career. Or I was born under a bad sign. I crashed and burned <laughs> somehow, you know. Or, or my parents never loved me or never wanted me. Or I never knew my parents or whatever, you know. Something led us to this, I, you know, I'm not good enough thing. I'm not good enough thing. There's something wrong with me. I am inherently broken. And that is a false belief. That is a false belief. Ernest Holmes said this. He said, if you have ever believed, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> if you have ever believed the stars govern you, or that your environment governs you, or that your opportunities govern you, recognize this as an hypnotic state into which you have fallen. 
It is a false belief pretending to be the truth, but it's not the truth. It is not the truth of us. And we continue to operate our lives as if it were true until we accept the truth that is underneath all along, until we accept the truth of our wholeness, the truth of our perfection, the truth of, of our complete soul. We will operate, we will continue to outpicture those less than conditions. When we accept the truth of us, we say we're whole, perfect, and complete. We say God is all there is. I am one as that. And when we get that, we realize that it's been there all along. You know, it's been there all along. It is underneath of, of all of those false beliefs that have been piled on top of us through life, through our parents, through our culture, through our work, whatever, whatever, whatever. Underneath, you know the story of the clay Buddha? You know, there was a story in 1957 in Thailand. They were moving, they were relocating a monastery. And uh, there was this huge clay Buddha, and they brought in cranes, and they're going to move it to the new location. And they saw that as they started to move it, the clay began to crack. And so work was brought to a halt. They didn't want to destroy it. And, and so they, they said, we're going to get a new crane, a bigger crane. And so they left. And overnight, the, the monks went out with a flashlight to see how much damage had been done to it. And when they looked at the cracks, uh, light reflected back to them. And so <laughs> they started chipping away at the clay. And what they realized was the clay was put on a solid gold Buddha statue. When the clay came off, what was underneath was a solid gold Buddha statue. And that had been done hundreds and hundreds of years before because an invading Burmese army was coming in. And they were afraid that they would see all that gold and want to steal it and take it from them. So the monks back then covered the, covered the statue in clay so it looked like just a clay Buddha, that it was worthless. And, um, and what happened basically was the Burmese army came through, killed all the monks anyway. And so no one ever knew what, what this true value, the true worth of this statue was. And so when new monks came to the place, it just stayed like that for hundreds of years until this time. The whole point of the story is <laughs> the gold is underneath. It's been there all along. And that's the way it is with us. The wholeness is there all along. We have just forgotten. We've fallen into that, that hypnotic state. We have fallen into that state of false belief. We are trying to get our wholeness somewhere. That's why self-help books are so popular, you know? We're going to try to find our, our wholeness out there. We're going to read about it. We're going to make it happen. We're going to get it. We're going to, you know, fix ourselves somehow so that we can become that thing that we already are. We are that thing. Underneath the clay of the false beliefs, underneath the, the dirt and the, and the piling on of the false beliefs of our, all of our experiences through life, what's underneath all along is that gold. That is who we are. That whole perfect and complete spirit is who we are. And we've covered it over. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Larger Life, Ernest Holmes said this. He said, there is a wellspring of life and perfection at the center of your being upon which you may draw. Every longing, every yearning you have ever had, every secret desire of your soul, every constructive ambition you have ever had is a whispering of this life assuring you that you are one with it. You are the concrete manifestation, a personification of it. You are a center where life is passing through you. Becomes definite and distinct and a unique individualization of itself. There is no one else like you in the universe. There never will be again. That's all there is. <laughs> that is it. It is spirit making itself known in form as you. And everything is there. We come fully loaded, <laughs> including floor mats, the whole bit, you know? <laughs> we, we come complete, perfect, whole, complete. We are that gold Buddha. So, so <laughs> instead of starting, you know, where we are with what we have, we postpone our good by requiring these conditions that are less than perfect to be perfect. Or we postpone our good or, or starting because we think we're somehow less than perfect. We doubt, we self-criticize, we self-condemn, we berate ourselves. Does anybody re recognize any of those statements or is it just me? <laughs> God, you're so dumb. You know, right? I mean, any, it, we do, we're such a great job of doing that. Louise Hayes said this. I love it. She said, you've been, cr you've been criticizing yourself for years and it hasn't worked. 
try approving of yourself and see what happens. Try approving of yourself and see what happens. So what are the other things that we do instead of starting? Instead of starting with what we have, right? So, so the conditions somehow have to be perfect, so then we have to somehow be perfect. We get an idea, we get an idea, and we forget that we did not generate it. We only own our brains, but we don't own the information that's downloaded into it. The ideas that come to us come to us from source from that universal mind, from God, flows as a divine ideal into our brains. It's like we're the hard drive we're being downloaded to. <laughs> so the idea is not ours. The idea is a divine ideal of God. And then it comes into our minds and we make it our own idea because we personalize it, because we are unique individualizations. So we personalize that divine ideal and make it our own idea through intuition or through inspiration. And then we don't do anything about it. It's like not valuing this gift that we have been given. It is a gift we've been given. We would not dismiss our ideas so casually and so thoughtlessly if we knew that they were divine ideals. It, wouldn't, it, it wasn't just us that came up with it. It's, it's, a, it's a God thing. <laughs> it's a, do you ever have a God idea? You have a God idea. These are divine ideas. They flow from universal mind into our mind where we then personalize them and make them our own. But there's only one mind. There's only the mind of God. And we individualize those things and we make them our own and then we act on them. But so let's not be so quick to, to dismiss ideas that we have, feelings we get, intuitions we receive. Because that is divine mind speaking to us. That is the higher self. That is the God self within us. The one mind of God that is speaking to us. And, and if we remembered, oh, that's not my big idea. That's a God idea. We wouldn't be, it wouldn't be so easy just to ca cast them aside and not do anything about them. Another thing that we do instead of starting... <laughs> is we, we catch a vision of something and then we just ignore it, you know? <laughs> and the one thing about that is spirit will not be denied. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But, you know, when you don't act on something and then you'll see it like two years later or five years later or ten minutes down the road and you'll go, wait, whoa, 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 I thought of that. That was my idea. Yeah, but you didn't do anything about it. So, you know what? Spirit did. Spirit moved on. And, and you know, the whole idea is there's one mind. So everybody has access to it. And if we don't act on it, eh, somebody will. Somebody will. You know, you remember that, those big ideas you had, right? And then you see them in form. You see them marketed. You see them on the, on the as seen on TV shows. <laughs> and you go, well, no, no, no. I thought of that 20 years ago. Yeah, but you didn't do anything about it, did you? Right? So spirit will have a way to, to create. Spirit always has a way to create. And if not through you, then through somebody else. We receive ideas all the time. They are divine downloads. And I have the free will to ignore it. Absolutely, absolutely. But if not through us, then through someone else. All of our ideas come from divine mind. That's all there is. When we say in core concept one that God is all there is and we are one with that, we are one immersed in that, we are one as that, that's exactly what we mean. There is only one divine mind. There is only one universal intelligence. And we're all using it. You know, same goes for improving things and fixing things and all of that. All of that information is just, is just downloaded into us. So when we see something that needs to be fixed or we see something that needs to be changed or improved, we can know it's, it's a good idea. It's a God idea. So if I get the vision that something needs to be done, I'll be the one to do it. It, was, it, was, it has come to me to do, so I'll do it. <clears throat> you know, <laughs> I love those. You know, somebody, not me, needs to do something about <laughs> X and so. We get that all the time around vision, you know, and I always laugh and say, yeah, sure, okay, whatever. <laughs> if you have the idea, guess what? It's yours to do, okay? If you have the idea, if you, ha if you have the vision, then it's yours to do. And if you want to pass on it, you can. 
We all have free will. You're absolutely free to do nothing about it. Spirit will bubble up in someone else and, and the idea and the motivation and the vision will come to somebody else. So if I receive, uh, if I receive a divine download, I, I, I have free will. We all do. You can do it or not do it, you know. But spirit will create in the physical world. That's what it does. Spirit creates in the physical world. And the only way it can create in the physical world is through us, through, uh, through our personalization of those divine ideals, through our inspiration. And then, and then we're, we're inspired and then we move to act. And then we create something in the real world. It is for us to do. This is the way that spirit shows up in the, in the manifest universe, through us. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. <laughs> Ideas, enthusiasm, inspiration, intuition. This is all spirit speaking to us. That little whisper that Ernest Holmes said. That little whisper that life is calling you to be greater and grander than you have previously shown up. That little whisper that life is living through us and, and has a greater idea for our life than our fears and our self-doubts and our criticisms about ourselves. What you are, you've been all along. The truth of who you are, you've been all along. That, that idea of being whole, perfect, and complete, it's not a process that you have to undergo in order to become that. It is what you are all along. And what we're doing is we're taking off all the clay. <laughs> we're taking off what has covered us up so that we can be the shining, radiant beings that spirit knows us to be in life so that we can do the unattainable and the unreachable and the impossible. I love that quote from, from um, was it Walt Disney who said, I love doing the impossible, it's so much fun. <laughs> I love, you know, when people say, oh, you can't do that, oh, watch me, watch me. Spirit can do whatever it can do through us and as us in the world, wherever we start from, wherever we start from. Ernest Holmes said this, he said, enthusiasm reaches out in joy. I love that. Enthusiasm reaches out in joy. There is nothing depressing about it. It reaches out in faith. There is no fear in it. It reaches out with acceptance. There's no doubt in it. It reaches out as a child. There is no uncertainty about it. Enthusiasm is a joyful trust in life, a happy outlook, a complete assurance and confidence that there is a power within us greater than we are and, enter, uh, and that we may use it. It should be our purpose to awaken this joy in us again and to enter into the game of living, not sitting on the sidelines as though we were isolated, but on the field ourselves. It is God's enthusiasm, and it becomes ours on acceptance. It becomes ours on acceptance. So this is the idea of just welcoming in by, by recognizing the truth of who we are. We, we can act on that. We act on that. We step into a fuller sense of life by recognizing our wholeness. We are that all along. So there is nothing missing, and there is nothing needed, and there are no additional parts you have to buy before you start what it is you want to start. Start where we are. We have to start where we are. Do what we can do with what we have. And we are endlessly supplied by a creator that is always, always giving to its own creation. And that is us. Spirit is forever taking on form and abandoning form in the physical world. We are always being endlessly, endlessly supplied with all the physical things that we need to express even greater ideas of who we are in the world. And who we are in the world are those solid gold Buddhas. <laughs> each individualized, each unique, no two alike. But that is the truth of who we are. And then we'll never run out of enthusiasm. We never run out of ideas. We never run out of inspiration. Because spirit is endlessly supplying. Just like we can never run out of love or joy or wisdom or wholeness or unity or power or peace, we can never run out of the qualities of God because spirit is forever supplying its creations, forever flowing into being, and we are those beings. Spirit is forever flowing into our experience of life as us. We can never run out of anything because spirit supports its own expression, and we are that. In Cosmic Light, Ernest Holmes said this, 
there is a place on the side of the mountain we are all ascending where, having gone beyond the peaks that obstructed the light for us, our ascent reaches an apex where no longer any shadows are cast. This is the light that is spoken of, the light that lights every man's path. And as you believe you live, believe that you are that light. As you believe in the possibility of your own soul, believe that it is God. And as you believe in God, believe in yourself. You are that. You are that. There is no separation. There is no damage done to the soul that is you. It's never been sick. It's never been ill. It's never been bad, whatever that means. (laughs) The soul that is you shines bright like the gold (laughs) on that Buddha. The soul that is you is perfect, whole, and complete in every way. And as we chip away at the clay of the false beliefs, we know that wherever we are is the right place. And whatever we choose to do is the right thing for us. And whenever we choose to start is the exact right and perfect moment to start with whatever we have around us, with whatever tools are at our disposal. We can know for sure that it's the right time, it's the right place, we're the right person with the right tools because spirit is guiding. Spirit's got our back always. Spirit has got our back always. Start now. Start today. Start where you are. Start with what you have and take that next step on your spiritual path. Whatever it is, whatever it is, to becoming more of what God wants you to be. Thank you so much. Thank you.